thinking of the sentiments expressed in the words of that last song, surely we recognize that only those who are members of the Lord's Church, who are Christians as the New Testament defines and uses that term, have a true scriptural right to sing it. Because they have rendered obedience to the gospel, their sins are remitted, and they have been added to the church by their Lord, and they're enjoying all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, for the Lord has located those blessings in the church of the living God. Ephesians 1 and verse 3. And yet it holds out to those who have not yet obeyed the gospel, who are outside of Christ, and are in need of salvation from their sins, a great, great hope. Because it says Christ has loved you and died for you and wants you to become a child of God. God stands ever ready, and that means Christ does, because He is God, to forgive every sin of every person. There is not a sin a man may commit that God will not forgive, provided that person is humble and meek and lowly enough to submit to the precepts and principles of truth, the commandments of God, in order to be saved from those sins. Throughout this study of the word of reconciliation, this has been the point that we've been making, and in fact, any gospel sermon either explicitly in just so many words or implicitly declares that. That if we would but receive with meekness the engrafted word, then it is certainly fully able by our submission to it to save our souls from sin. And that's a wonderful thing. It removes the consequences from sin. It removes fear from your life. It lets you bask in the good pleasure of God and the love of God to know that Jesus Christ is your only mediator between God and man that he ever liveth to make intercession for you, and that you have the expectation of eternal life when this world is over, seeing that you would live faithful to him until death. I hope these things have been always kept before you, and for that matter, in every sermon, in every Bible study, but especially in this study of the Word of Reconciliation. Again, I will read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning in verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. And of course, Paul is speaking here of the apostles. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. That's a wonderful passage of Scripture. It reminds us, because he wrote it to the church, and we are the church if we believe and obey the gospel, that we have this great hope of eternal salvation because of God, his love for us, the great plan of salvation that comes through what Christ did in dying on the cross, which death we brought to memory as an act of worship and this worship assembly is ordained by God in the New Testament just a moment ago. We have tried to set out a series of lessons, this very first principle, very fundamental, each one standing on its own, but all connected, one leading to the other and building upon the one that preceding it. And so it is with this one. I don't think you could get much more basic than what we shall do and have done and Hopefully until we finish this, we'll continue to do. For those of us who have known the truth and from the heart obeyed it and lived the Christian life for years, it still reminds us of the foundation in our life and the first principles that we've continued to build upon 
of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which is God's power to save us from sin, Romans 1.16. The commands in the Bible, this is an important point, the commands in the Bible are either moral or positive. I'll say it again and we'll develop it. The commands in the Bible fall into one of two classes. They would be considered moral, the moral class, or the positive class. Now let me further elaborate on this. A moral precept enjoins an action or a duty on us that is right in the very nature of things and it is commanded of God to us because it is right. But the other category, a positive category or a positive precept, enjoins an action which becomes a duty simply and only because God commanded it. Moral precepts, let me give you an example, such as thou shalt not kill, literally thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not steal, lie not one to another, all grow out of man's relation to man. However, positive precepts, things that are right only because God commanded them, that would have to do with animal sacrifice, and our subject today, baptism, prayer, the Lord's Supper, our observance of it, of course, all grow out of man's relation to God. A man's love for man and regard for his rights influence him to obey moral precepts. Love for God and respect for His authority alone prompt us to obey positive precepts. I say again, positive law is that which is right only, 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 only because God said so. There is really no visible relationship, logically speaking, between the thing commanded and when you keep that commandment, the blessing given. Tell me why God should forgive any man's sin because he is immersed in water. From a human standpoint in this life, what is the relationship of immersion in water to one's sins being washed away? There's not any. None whatsoever. It's right for one reason only. God said so. It's very interesting that when you consider the churches all around us that we know are denominational churches. That there's never been a conflict with them over belief in Jesus Christ, Son of God. There's never been a conflict with them over the meaning of repentance. When it was properly studied, they teach the same thing. Not saying the order they give it, things like that, but the actual meaning of it. And even in confessing one's faith in Christ to be the Son of God, do you know of any debates with the denominations by members of the Lord's church over hearing the gospel, believing the gospel, repenting of one's sins, as we studied last week, confessing one's faith in Christ? But there have been, when men had love of the truth and conviction and the courage of their conviction, which conviction, of course, is built by the Word of God. Myriad of debates. I couldn't tell you how many on baptism. Have you ever asked why? Well, it's logical among all sorts of human affairs for one to receive information, and the information lead one to believe in something. And that if you were believing in this, and the information properly understood has led you to now believe in something else, that you would have to turn from one to the other. And that you would be willing to confess that, yes, I used to work over here, but this fit me more perfectly, and I came to understand better about this job, and so I now confess that I'm working for so-and-so. People see that in every phase of life. They have no problem with it. But they have a big problem with saying and complying with, you must be baptized in water for the remission of sins. You ever wonder why that works on people like that? 
one of the big reasons is why we're talking about the different classifications of the laws of God. Moral law, there's something visible and understandable on the part of man as to why one must do this as it relates to something else and leads to something else. But there's just no visible connection between being immersed in water and God in his mind saying, you're forgiven of your sins. Baptism is right as it's taught in the New Testament of the Great Commission because God said so. No other reason. Those commands are the ones that really test our confidence, our faith, our trust in God and His Word. That's why we talk about faith and the simplest definition is taking God at His Word. Now, you know, the Old Testament which was written aforetime for our learning, can give us a great deal of insights into this. In 2 Kings 5, Naaman, without going through the whole story, is a great man, a Syrian, great general, but he's a leper. Now again, in our day and time, we don't understand the stigma placed upon a person as it was then for being a leper. He would do anything to be cleansed of that leprosy. So to make a long story short, he learns of the prophet in Israel who can, by his word, cleanse him. So he puts all of his regalia together and all sorts of rewards and heads off down to find the prophet. Well, he does, finally. The prophet does not even come out and see him personally. He sends his servant out, a man by the name of Gehazi, and tells him to dip seven times in the muddy river Jordan. This offended him. he just come from a mountainous country. Beautiful streams, even mentions two rivers. Couldn't I have done that there? He had his mind made up as to how, because of the pagan gods and the way they operated and worshipped to them, how this god of this prophet would heal him. And the man turned away very, very angry. And he had some reasonable servants who said, now, now, my Lord, you know, if he had bid you do some great thing, you were prepared to do that. So why don't you go ahead and do this? And thus he humbled himself. And he did as the prophet told him to do. And when he dipped the seventh time, he came up with his skin like a little child. Why was he so determined not to do what was so simple. It made any sense to him. It just didn't make sense. It's not what he thought ought to be. It didn't look right to him as a mere human being. Do you understand now why that there is a way that seems right to a man, but at the end there are the ways of death? Because we have our minds made up many times how things ought to work, and it works real well when we can see the relationship of the thing commanded to the blessing given when we obey the commandment. But when, it's, when it doesn't make any sense that if I do this, you mean I should receive that? Would you really believe somebody if you received a, con a, a phone call or a letter or somebody came to your door and said, uh, if you'll walk down to the end of your driveway, hold your arms like that and holler that Texas a and is the greatest thing under the sun and then come back into your house, I'll give you $100 million. Would you believe it? Well, that's exactly the way it affected Naaman. And that's exactly the way it impacts denominational people who rely strictly on moral law. When you say, you must be immersed in water by the authority of Christ before God will forgive any sin and make you a Christian. That sounds just as strange to you. Because they're all hung up on this one class of law, and that's moral law. And yet, we have that example as just one of them in 2 Kings 5 that says those laws that really test your confidence, faith, and trust in God and His Word are laws that never show the relationship logically the way men think between the thing commanded and the blessing given when you obey the commandment. Those are the only laws that really try your faith in God. And there are many of them. 
Where is there, why is there a problem in the denominational world that confesses Jesus Christ to be the Son of God of partaking of the Lord's Supper on every first day of the week when they have no problem at all taking up money every time they get together? Where's the problem? Same reason. It's the kind of reasoning they're doing, the kind of viewpoint they have. You see, that's why you have the spiritual man being able to be the only one that will understand the way of righteousness. We're going to talk about that some, Lord willing, this afternoon, what that means. But it simply means you're willing to receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. And there's a lot of folks that aren't. Naaman almost didn't. And he didn't at first. And he was persuaded that you ought to go ahead and do this. And so it is that there's the demarcation point. Compliance or non-compliance with moral precepts indicates also a man's feeling toward his fellow man. Compliance or non-compliance with positive precepts is a test of man's loyalty to God. And it must be something that is right for one reason and one reason only. God said so. Now that will really test your faith. And that's what happened in the case of Naaman and dipping seven times in the river Jordan that he might receive cure of his leprosy. Men without faith in God may observe moral duties, but they observe all of them not necessarily to show God that they love him and that they will keep his commandments and that they will always perform according to what he wants them to do. Folks, atheists who deny the existence of God will take care of their children. Now somebody says, yes, but you know, the atheist idea implies thus and so and thus and so. But see, atheists don't live up <laughs> to what their atheism really means. And I'm glad they don't. Because if you were atheist, then really you could say, I just don't like you, I don't like you to the point where I'm going to kill you. What is it to him? in view of his denial of God, and thus any precepts of God. But he won't murder you nine times out of ten, maybe a lot higher percentage than that, because he's afraid of the punishment the government might put on him. And none of it has to do with fear of God. He doesn't even believe in God. And that's very important to understand the right division of the word and understanding the word of reconciliation and how it works to reconcile us to God and the nature of the commandments found therein. Faith in God must lead to the observance of all laws of God, but it's the positive laws that test our faith in God because they are right only because God said so. How many times have people said, I just can't see that? Not in the sense they don't understand intellectually, but it's because they just don't believe that God means what he says. And that in his word, which they read and intellectually grasp, says what he means. In every dispensation, there have been positive precepts. Different in character, it's true, yet all were given as a test of man's faith. As I've just shown in 2 Kings chapter 5, in the case of Naaman. And thus the institution of baptism belongs to this class of duties, as I think I've also shown. It grows not out of man's relation to man, but it grows out of man's relation to God. It was an institution that Jesus Christ, while in the flesh, though he was sinless, honored by being obedient to it. John the Immerser came to precede Christ to prepare the Jewish people for their Messiah. And in so doing, he was to preach a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Mark 1 and verse 4. It was the way God was making the Jews ready for the kingdom of heaven which Jesus would set up. You see, they had to repent of sins under the law of Moses with a resolve to turn back to live like the law said, yet also believing the message that the kingdom of God was at hand. And they were to be baptized to show that. We'll talk more about that. This all was involved in, we'll say, the word of reconciliation because the people were being prepared for the Christ. That meant reconciliation to God. 
Now they were either prepared by John's baptism when they believed and obeyed it, or they weren't. Jesus said, or God said, they would be. Now when you look at every case of conversion as we have set it out from the book of Acts, you will see that all those people who received with the proper attitude, with meekness, the engrafted or implanted word, believed in Christ on the basis of the truth they heard and understood, repented of their sins, confessed their faith in Christ, and were baptized for the remission of sins. And they've done that, and they proved their love of God and their faith in God by so doing. I firmly believe that a careful an honest reading of any accurate translation of the New Testament without the help of any kind of exegetical authority or commentaries. If we'll just read the text, God wrote it for us to understand it. God wrote it to teach us. If we'll truly study it, as 2 Timothy 2.15 says, that we'll be enabled to understand the truth of God and the answers to the questions, what is baptism? Who should be baptized? And for what purpose? Now, in order to get this subject clearly before us, we'll be going back over, for most everybody here, passages that you've been exposed to for years and years and years. So, one, the passages that refer to John's baptism, we will look at for a moment. I saw it say study, but we won't go that deep into them. And we will look, Further into the word of reconciliation in which baptism is mentioned. That is those words that mention that, that have it recorded therein. And the third point is those found in the preaching and writing of the apostles of Christ, the ambassadors of the government of heaven to the world of men. So follow with me as we go through these for a little bit. In Matthew 3, 5, and 6, Concerning John's baptism and his ministry to prepare the Jewish people for the Christ. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan confessing their sins. Then in verses 13 through 16, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he, that is John, suffered Christ. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water. Now, let me make further comment about that. The Jews, in order to be prepared for the kingdom of heaven and to receive their Messiah properly, needed to repent of their sins against the law of Moses and resolve of heart to continue to live it and believe the message of John. Jesus didn't need to do that. So when he says, uh, suffer it to be so now, that is, to baptize me, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Now all of God's righteousness, of course, those are the commandments of God. Psalms 119, verse 172. What Jesus is saying is that in the flesh I'm a Jew. And this commandment is for Jews. John recognized you don't need to be baptized for the remission of sins. But Jesus said since this commandment is for the Jew and I'm a Jew, I will fulfill it in submitting to it. Thus he showed the importance of rendering obedience to God's will. And thus he was baptized for that reason, not for the reason of remission of sins. John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river, Jor river of Jordan, confessing their sins, Mark 1, 4, and 5. In verse 8, I indeed have baptized you with water, Jesus said, but he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost. And in Luke 7, 29 and 30, And all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized of him. Obviously, 
you reject God when you don't do what he says. In this case, he said be baptized. And if you aren't baptized, you reject God. The baptism of John, Jesus asked. Whence was it? From heaven or of men? Matthew 21, 25. In John 3, 23, and John also was baptizing in Anon near to Salim because there was much water there. And other passages refer to John's baptism. But to quote them would, I think, be only a repetitive thing because they teach the same thing as those I've just read. But from these I did read and others like them, we learn some facts. First of all, John's baptism was from heaven, not from men. It was a part of the counsel of God. Those submitting to it, justifying God, and those not submitting to it, rejecting the counsel of God against themselves. I learned that much water was necessary. I learned that baptism in this case took place in a river, the River Jordan. I see, too, that Jesus, after his baptism, came up out of the water. And connected with repentance, it was for the remission of sins. And those baptized were adults or of an age sufficient by their own free will to come and confess their sins, which implies they knew what sin was, and they needed confessing because they understood the commandment of God taught to them. They said they had to do so, and that they had to be baptized. That ought to rule out babies. And it does. Next point is that in the word of reconciliation, we find this in Matthew 28, 19. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in, the King James says, actually it's in two. It's different from Acts 2, 38. There is in. But here it's in two. So you see what you're seeing in Acts 2 verse 38? By the authority of Christ you ought to be baptized for the remission of sins. In fact, you must. But when you see it taught in Matthew 28 verse 19, that baptism of Jesus, authorized by Jesus, is a baptism for the remission of sins into a saved relationship with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And that's what Jesus was saying in Matthew 28, 19. If you're going to have a saved relationship with the Lord, you must be baptized by the authority of Christ because it's a baptism into Christ, which Paul said in Galatians 3.27, and it's baptized into a saved relation with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then we read in the account of Mark, Mark 16, 15, 16, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Well, from these scriptures, what do we learn? We learn that Jesus authorized baptism. We learn that it's transitional, inducing into the ineffable names, as I said earlier, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. We see that this baptism follows being taught and that believers only are to be baptized and that it is a condition of salvation from sin. Now, if you go to Luke's writing in Acts of the Apostles, and also in the letters, you find in Acts 2.38, to those who have been taught the truth and proven to them by proofs, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Messiah. Then Peter said unto them, because they were convicted of that, and they cried out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 37, and Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2.38. And the scripture then says in verse 41, On the day the church started, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. In Acts 8 in verse 12, But when they believed Philip, Remember how we studied all these cases? Philip the Evangelist, Samaria. When they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. In verse 13, he singles out Simon. We spent some time on him. And the scripture says, Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip. In verses 36 through 39, And as they went on their way, they came into certain water talking about the Ethiopian eunuch, the same human preacher, Philip. He preached unto him Jesus, 
As they went on their way, they came into a certain water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they both went down into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, but the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Then in the case of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, the believing, repentant Saul of Tarsus in Acts 22, 16 is told by the great preacher Ananias whom the Lord selected and sent to him. And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Calling on the name of the Lord. Now grammatically, the calling on the name of the Lord was arising and being baptized. That's how you call on the name of the Lord. It's not just saying, Lord, save me. It's an attitude of submission and receiving with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save the soul. So one calls on the name of the Lord to be saved when he renders obedience to the gospel by being baptized for the mission of sins. In Acts 9 and verse 18, following this you'll notice, and he received sight forthwith, speaking of Paul, Saul of Tarsus at that time, and arose and was baptized. Then at the conversion of the first Gentile, uh, uncircumcised Gentile convert, Cornelius and his household, God spoke directly from heaven by miraculous power and said the Gentiles have a right to the gospel just like you Jews. And so Peter stood up and said, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then we read also, and he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his straight way. Speaking of the Philippian jailer, taking care of Paul and Barnabas. Acts 16, It should be Paul and Silas. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized, Acts 18, 8. And then in writing to those who had believed and heard the gospel or heard and believed it and obeyed it. Paul, in order to rejuvenate them and enliven them, remind them so they'll be stronger, faithful, more zealous servants of the Lord, said to the church at Rome, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should also walk in newness of life. Paul said to the Colossians in Colossians 2, 12, Buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. Then he said to the Galatian churches in Galatians 3, 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. And to the church in Corinth, all of these having heard the same gospel, believed and obeyed the same thing. He said, for by one spirit are we all baptized in one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Then Peter, many years later, writing to Jewish Christians, said the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. By the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 1 Peter 3, 21. Well, now, what do we do with these scriptures? If you're reading these at home, what do you do with them now that you've read them? Well, by careful induction of these scriptures, we can determine the facts that we shall now note. Number one, baptism is a command of Jesus Christ, Acts 10, 48. Number two, believers in Christ are to be baptized, Acts 8, 12, 37, and chapter 18, 8. Number three, water is the element into which one is baptized, Acts 8, 36, and chapter 10, verse 47. Number four, before baptism, there was a coming to and a going down into the water. And after baptism, there's a coming up out of the water, Acts 8, 36 through 39. And number five, we'll see why. Baptism is a burial, Romans 6, 4, Colossians 2, 12. And number six, it was of sufficient importance to be attended to immediately after persons became believers, Acts 16 and verse 33. And number seven, by it, that is baptism, those who were prepared for it in heart and life by faith and repentance 
were inducted into Christ, into his body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 and Galatians 3, 27. Number eight, from it, the new life of service to God begins. Romans 6 and verse 4. And number nine, and as redemption, remission of sins, salvation from sin is in Christ, it is for, unto, in order to, the forgiveness of the remission of sins. Acts 2 verse 38 and chapter 22 verse 16. <clears throat> now we close with this. In the form, or we might call it ritual, <clears throat> by which persons are inducted into all organized institutions, there is, mark it, a consummating act. That consummating act must be attended to in the way the laws of the order require before one is entitled <clears throat> to the privileges and the blessings of the order. It is so of the church of the living God. There is a form by which persons are admitted. That form has its consummating act. And that act is baptism in water. By the authority of Christ. Into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. For unto the remission or forgiveness of one's sins. To enjoy the privileges and blessings of citizenship in the church of the living God. The kingdom of Christ. The body of Christ. The family of God on this earth. Then it's imperative. One must. It's obligatory. Attend to this consummating act in the way the law of the Lord directs. Now, I guess I can say this. I've tried to milk this for all it's worth. And when people tell me these first principle things are just light, then I realize to a great extent I'm talking to a lightweight. There is so much to be gleaned from the implications of the totality of the information of these fundamental first principle matters. It's more than just hear the gospel, believe the gospel, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Christ, be baptized. Oh, that's it. And not to be thought lightly of but to understand the relationship of all those things and what each does and what, um, what it does in the person who understands it is what we've been trying to emphasize, to understand the natures and the laws of God. If you're not a Christian, and you've learned how this morning, if you've listened and understood how to become a child of the living God, a Christian, a member of the body of Christ. If as a child of God you've sinned, there is a second law of pardon, to repent of those sins, Confess those sins and pray to God for forgiveness. Whether you're outside of Christ, needing to become a Christian, when you from the heart obey that form of doctrine, Romans 6, 17, 18, God in His mind says, all your sins and iniquities I remember against you no more. For the child of God who sins, when you repent truly from the heart and ask God for forgiveness, having confessed those sins, which is indicative of your repentance, God says, I forgive every one of them. God wants to forgive man, but when he made man a free moral agent with the power of choice, and he made him intellectual, then that man has to receive with meekness the truth of God in his word and be willing to change his ways by his will to submit to God's will in the gospel. It's that simple. There has to be a way that we show God we love him and that we have faith in him and his system of salvation. And how would you do it without rendering obedience to God's will, whether it's those things that have to do with becoming a Christian or a person in the church who sins and needs forgiveness? If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we invite you to come while we stand and sing.